and our next speaker is Lucas DeVos talking about symmetries in tensor networks. some time for questions maybe. So is this is this on? Yeah, good. Hi. Um, so hi everyone. I'm I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm a PhD student from uh, the quantum group in Ghent, and it's really nice to, to be able to present some of uh, the work we've been doing there. Um, so first off, let, let me say something about the quantum group. I mean, the website is the QR code. It should lead you there. So there's plenty of information that you can find there. But um, in short, we're actually we are a group that are working on tensor network methods. Um, and this is like a framework that you can use to do some numerics in quantum simulations, um, and but also uh, has led to some fundamental research uh, in, in the area. Um, and so in Ghent, we've really been, been uh, using Julia for, for a lot of the, the, the software we have been developing, of course, because of the performance, but also because of the, the way that's actually quite flexible. Uh, and so what I want to do first is actually um, give, a, give a shout out to two of the people from Ghent that really are like the, the main authors of, of most of the software that we are using there today. Um, and so the first person that I really want to, well, give a, give a big shout out to is Professor Jutro Hagerman. Um, he's actually the main author of TensorKit and Tensor Operations, which is the two packages I want to highlight today. Um, but also has been really like an active member of the community, uh, of the Julia community, and has actually um, authored multiple um, community-wide uh, packages that, that are, are used. Um, and then the second person that I, that I want to highlight is Maarten van Damme. Um, he's actually here in the audience today. Um, and so what he basically did is he gave uh, us most of the tensor network uh, libraries that we are using today to run the simulations. So in some sense, he's like, uh, given all of the people from Ghent uh, the, the, the tools to run their numerics, uh, which is quite cool. And so I'll also give like a, a small uh, showcase at the very end uh, using some of, of, of this software. Um, so like without further ado, I, I will go quickly into um, the tensor network things that I want to talk about today. Uh, and so the first thing that I, I want to say is that well, whenever you are dealing with a tensor network uh, algorithm, um, I mean, one of the basic things you will first encounter, and it's actually probably like the most important thing, is that you want to be able to evaluate a, a tensor network. Of course, that's where the name is coming from. Um, and so what the community, the tensor network community, has been adopting for, for quite a while is this di diagrammatic notation um, of specifying tensor networks. And the idea is that for every vertex, you uh, associate uh, a, a tensor or like a vector or a matrix. And then all of the edges that come out of the vertices uh, correspond to one of the indices. And so what you have over here is like a, a vector, which is just a vertex with one edge, or a matrix with two edges, and then a more general tensor, um, which has like five uh, edges. Um, and then, I mean, the powerful thing we have with, with this diagram, uh, diagrammatic notation is that if we connect these edges, what we actually mean is uh, that we want to sum over the indices. And so this is some form of like a generalized multi uh, matrix multiplication. Um, and so you can do like a basic matrix vector m multiplication, but also some more gen general uh, things fit in this framework. Um, and so this is, this is definitely the, the main part of most of the tensor network algorithms you want to do. And so one of the most natural things you can ask is, OK, I have my drawings. I have my tensor networks. Well, how will I put this in my, in my code? How will I put this into Julia? How will I tell Julia how to deal with this? And so this is basically what tensor, uh, tensor operations.gl is all about. Um, and so what the, the idea is is that um, tensor operations provide you, provides you with a, a macro, 
and the marker takes in what's generally called um, Einstein's summation uh, expressions. And so the idea is you, like you draw your diagrams, you put names of the, the different tensors in there, and then you also name each of the edges. And so, of course, connecting edges means that an edge uh, has uh, like a label that appears twice in the, in the resulting expression. And then um, labels that only appear once, you, you will identify between the left and the right hand side. And so what you want your program to do is basically you want to analyze this resulting expression and parse it into a series of like more basic operations that would correspond to like pairwise contraction of one of the edges or addition or maybe just like a, a trace on a single tensor. And so this is what tensor operations does for you and just to highlight what's happening behind the scenes and why you would definitely not want to be doing this manually is that this very small uh, tensor network actually expands to this, uh, this huge uh, expression. Um, and so what's really important here is that really the, the evaluation of this, this um, labels or the, like the analysis that, that really um, pairs these uh, operations up is all happening at compile time. Because it's a macro, this, uh, this, this is happening only once at compile time and this is really quite critical because this is definitely one of the hot, uh, uh, the hot spots for performance within the tensor network um, algorithms you, you will have. Um, and so one of the things that I've recently done, done quite a bit of work on and that I'm, that I'm very excited to present to you is the fact that we uh, have announced or released version four last week of uh, tensor operations. And so I wanna quickly glance over some of the things that we changed, added. Um, and, and so one of the first things is like just the general update of our interface. Um, and also of the documentation. So really like do go have a look at the, the documentation. We put a lot of time and effort in there in order to make it very easy for people to, to see what's going on. Also very easy for developers to, to plug in their own tensor or array-like types. Um, and so this, this should definitely help. And then some other thing that we also like added there is, is some more, um, some, a, a better interface for the allocation and the freeing of, of the temporary intermediate um, op uh, objects that can arise within these expressions. Um, and then there's actually two of the main quality of life updates that we, that we added in this new release. And so one of the things that, that we often stumble with is that because our expression is uh, parsed at, at compile time, one of the things you do not have access to is the sizes of your arrays. So um, at the point where you have the information of your labels, you don't have the information of the sizes. And then of course at runtime, when you have the information of the sizes, you do not have the information of the labels le left because these are all compiled away. And so what, what ended up happening is that we had like this very cryptic error messages as you can see on the top where you, well, Somewhere in this expression, there is an object that doesn't fit. You are trying to contract two tensors that don't fit with each other. But you have no idea where. And this is quite a, a small uh, tensor network. So you can imagine that as the networks get bigger, this becomes very easily like a big problem. And so we added one of the things um, is like a keyword um, optional uh, runtime check for these uh, specific uh, problems where we, will, we can now enable this to debug your code and then it will tell you, ah, well, the non-matching dimension is happening at uh, label L and it will also precisely tell you what, like, what the sizes are and why, why it's errory. Um, a second thing that, that we've added and that, well, that's already been in there but that we've uh, kind of enhanced is the ability to optimize the, the order in which your contractions are happening. And so really this is quite a crucial thing in the sense that it can make a difference between your operation, your network um, evaluating within seconds, or if you're doing it wrong, it will evaluate in, in hours and like in worst cases, um, even days. So it's, it's quite crucial that you have the, the right uh, contraction order in there. And so what was already in tensor operations and what I want to highlight uh, again is that there's like a, a, an, an algorithm in there that will analyze your, your network and it will try to get like one of the um, optimal orderings for your contraction. Um, and so 
again, because this is a compile time thing, you do not actually have access to the information of the sizes. And this is, of course, quite important to determine the optimal order. Um, and so what, what was in there before is like very often you do know which ones of the indices are actually the dominating uh, ones, which ones are really big, which ones you want to scale up uh, as your algorithms uh, change. And so this is what like the top line is on there with, where you would say the red uh, connecting indices are the dominating ones. Again, if you want to actually debug this and check that you had the optimal order, you would need to insert runtime checks for this. And so again, we, we added like a an, an keyword argument that can enable like a runtime check to see if, well, given the sizes that you currently have, is this uh, contraction order you're doing actually optimal? And so um, as you can see below, the, 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 in this case, this would not be the case and it will print out a warning for you and also tell you the optimal order. So uh, an extra thing we did um, is we started, uh, we, we had actually the wish of, of being able to play around with different implementations of the, of the default um, basic operations that are in there. And so this was not really possible with the way that it was currently implemented. If you wanted to have a different implementation, you would have to wrap your array or wrap your tensor in a, in a custom type and then try to define all new methods on this. And so we kind of changed this around and left uh, like room for uh, any, any person that wants to come in and, and write their own backend to just uh, enable this through like a, another keyword argument, uh, just select the backend. And the same thing with the allocation. So if you want to experiment with like a, a custom caching for, for like your allocated tensors, then this is also something you can now do. And so, I mean, as a proof of principle, we implemented this with, for the TBLIS library, which is a, a one of the, the pre-existing um, implementations of these uh, basic tensor operations. And so in that sense, like changing the backend is as easy as just adding the, the keyword argument there. Um, and then finally, like something else I want to add here is that we also have GPU support in there. And so thanks to the, the, the Julia 1.9 work that has been going on, the tensor operations no longer needs to depend on, on CUDA for this. Uh, and we moved this to like a package uh, extension. So it's really nice to have this like loaded in uh, only when you need it. Um, and then finally, like uh, may maybe the most uh, like exciting feature for um, for like the user, the end user is that actually because the because of the fact that um, the, like providing derivatives for tensor networks is is quite easy um, in the sense that I mean it, there's not a lot of of different operations going on there. Uh, we managed to write the the chain rules for um, for these basic operations all in terms of the basic operations. Um, and so what this actually means is that any, any array or any tensor type that supports what is like the, the six basic interface uh, operations we have out there will automatically benefit from the chain rules that are written there and just will work with automatic differentiation. And so um, if you just know how to evaluate your diagram, you can um, take gradients uh, however you, you like and this will all happen automatically. Um, and so I guess that leads me to the, the second part of, of this talk and it's a, the, the second package, again, uh, authored by Yuto. Um, and so what I wanna talk a little more about now is, is actually the tensors themselves. Um, and so uh, in order to, to illustrate what I, what I wanna get across is that within the tensor network uh, algorithms, you really want to be taking as much of the structure of the problem at hand uh, in, into, into, your, um, into your algorithms because these can really lead to, to major speed ups. And so what I mean with structure is like, uh, if, if I give like a concrete example, um, in the, you can think of a Heisenberg model, which is like a toy model for, for quantum magnetism where you have neighboring spins that are, uh, that are interacting. And so if you look at these tensors, or if you look at this, this Heisenberg Hamiltonian, then you can already see that there's quite a lot of structure in there. Like the, the, there's, it's not only very sparse, it's also like the, the pattern of sparsity is, is quite distinct. And so actually what, what, what's going on here, or what's happening behind the scenes is 
because of the fact that your interaction is rotationally invariant, these, uh, these, these tensor elements, they really are, they, they cannot just be anything they like. They have to respect the symmetry, and this actually puts quite a few constraints on there. And so in order to really like illustrate what's going on here, if you would enforce the symmetry and then just see how many free param parameters you have left, then you are left with only 42. There's only 42 free parameters if you want to keep the symmetry, meaning 982 uh, parameters that are completely redundant and that you do not need to store, do not need to compute, uh, do not need to do anything with. Um, and so this is really like a, a major difference in compute time, uh, clearly, if you can incorporate this within the tensor network uh, algorithms. Um, and so like this is, this is what I want to convey is that you really want to be using these, these symmetries if they're there. Um, so let me elaborate a little bit more on actually what it means to be symmetric. Um, in, in the sense that what, the, what we're actually talking about when we're talking about symmetric things is the fact that if you have a Hilbert space, you can actually like really, in, in a given symmetry, you can really like start to divide up your, your Hilbert space into different sectors that actually correspond to the different representations of, of how your transformations or how your symmetry is acting on this Hilbert space. And so what it means to be symmetric is that this is actually, th this is completely invariant. You cannot change this anymore once, once these different sectors are there. And so effectively, if you, if you would write down a linear map, there is some basis that you can write down that's completely block diagonal. Because, well, if you would have off diagonal blocks there, you would start mixing between these different sectors and this is not allowed by the symmetry. Um, and so this is exactly the reason why there were so many zeros in the, in the, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And so this is, of course, one of the things that we really want to want to make use of. Um, and in fact, you can you can do this more generally for any tensor. And what's what you're left with is that, well, there's actually like a structural part in your in your tensor and a data part. And the structural part is completely fixed by the symmetry. This is something that's, well, first off, invariant, and also it's, it's shared between all tensors of the same shape. Um, and so really, this means you do not have to keep recomputing this all the time. And the only thing you really need to keep track of is the data, um, which contains a lot fewer parameters. Um, and then what's really nice is actually like the, the, the underlying symmetry group or like the more generalized group structures, um, and the mathematics of this actually tell you how to manipulate the, the, the stru structural part. And so if you are able to keep track of how these manipulations are going on, you don't ever even need to keep the structural part, not even once. Um, and so this is what TensorKit is, is doing for you. It's basically, you forget about all of this. This is happening behind the scenes. It will do the bookkeeping for you, and then just what, what you are left with is a package that can do the, the basic tensor operations, such, a, such as like permutations or contractions or factorizations, such as SVDs or QRs. Um, and these will like all keep track of the, the symmetric um, components uh, for you. Um, and so, well, let me just finally highlight what's already in there, so and what's supported by, by this framework. And so what I wanted to say is that really this is about as general as you can get it um, in the sense that it supports abelian symmetries, it supports non-abelian symmetries, and it also supports non-abelian symmetries that has, have multiple fusion. You can also just take direct products of any of these. So this means that, of course, like the, the ones we have implemented is like the, the regular Zn or U1 symmetries but also SU2 and more generically SUN is in there and you can take multiple copies of this and this will all work. Um, but what's more, and, and this is actually like, like going beyond the group case, is that you can also put the, the, the framework of fermionic symmetries or even like more gen general anionic symmetries in there. And this is still using the exact same bookkeeping um, working out to be the, the same thing. And so what we also have in there is like a, the Fibonacci category or the Eisen category. And if you have a look at like the category data there, you will find that like all small categories up to six elements are supported by, by TensorKit. Um, and then finally, um, I want to mention like the last one, which is even quantum group symmetries, which like, like this Q deformed SU2 
uh, for those of you that know what it is, is also supported by, by TensorKit. And so I, I guess that leaves me with like a couple more minutes to show like how this would be put into action and, and what it can actually give you to, to be able to use this. And so this is where I can tie back to like mpskit.jl, um, which is, well, the, the main tensor network library or the matrix product state library that we're using in Ghent, written uh, by Martin again. And so um, what's in there is, is basically like the, the ground states and the time evolution or like correlation functions, exp expectation values for anything that's basically 1D or quasi 1D. Um, and so this would also include like honeycomb lattices on a cylinder if you, if you would like this. This is also in there. Um, and so let me, let me give you two concrete examples of this. Um, and so the first thing that I wanna, I wanna do is, is tell you a little bit about the, the Hubbard model. Um, this is a, a model for spinful uh, fermions on a lattice that are, that are hopping around. And so one of the things that we know about this is that, I mean, for a generic filling factor, you can have uh, an SU2 cross U1 and fermionic symmetry in there. And so what TensorKit allows you to do is, I mean, you can enforce all of these symmetries together. Um, and then if you have a look at the dispersion relationship, um, you can actually plot the dispersion relation of um, all the uh, elementary excitations at half filling. And so what's predicted and what theory tells you is that there will be a separation between the charge and the spin excitations. And because of the fact that we are enforcing the symmetry, you can really target these separately. So on the left, you have the spinon excitations for different values of the parameters, and we, we perfectly reproduce these. And then on the right, you have the, the holon, anti-holon dispersion relation, and, and again, we can like, quite uh, easily find the, minimum, the minima of, of, of these dispersion relations. And this is really, like, uh, and this what I want to emphasize is that this is really only possible if you actually are able to enforce these symmetries because otherwise you would never uh, be able to target this, this, uh, this way. Um, and then the second example I want to give is like a modified version of the, the Heisenberg model, um, which includes some form of anisotropy in the, in the Z direction. And so there is this parameter delta in there, which if you set it to one, will recover your, your initial Heisenberg model. And so what we know is that for delta is equal to one, this has a regular SU2 symmetry. And then as soon as you change your delta, this SU2 symmetry is no longer there and you're left with only a U1 symmetry. And because this is an, is an abelian symmetry, this will actually gain you less by, by way of like computing power. Um, but again, theory tells you that there's still some way you can put an SU2 non-abelian sym symmetry in there. And the way this is done is by doing like a Q deformation of this SU2. And so you, get, you end up with this quantum group symmetry and we actually implemented this. Um, and so like on the, on the right hand side, you can see that the, the, the results match up perfectly. But on the left hand side, what's actually really interesting there is that the blue dots you can see on top is what would happen with the amount of parameters, the amount of free parameters if you don't impose any symmetry. And then like this is about the order of 150 um, for a given precision. And then, of course, if you, if you put in the U1 symmetry, you already get to reduce this by quite a bit, and you're left with like 50 to 75 um, parameters. Uh, and then, of course, if you're still able to put in the full non-abelian SU2, albeit uh, a little deformed, then you are left with less than 25 parameters. So you go from like 175 to 25, you, all of your algorithms will run a lot faster and will converge a, a lot smoother. Um, and so that kind of leaves me with, with like uh, uh, some things to look out for in the very near future. Um, so we're currently working on both like the GPU support for this tensor kit, uh, including all of the tensors. And I can say there that like we're actually about 75% of the way there. So you can really expect this in the, in the very, very near future. Um, and the same goes for the, the automatic differentiation of the factorizations. So the, the tensor operations one, is already automatically in there, as, as mentioned before. So you can do contractions and the uh, automatic differentiation will work. But uh, the, for the factorizations, you still have to wait like a couple weeks TM. Um, and then something else that we, we, we really want to be working on is maybe like for, for a, a bit further down the, the line 
is we want to have like an automatic way of, of computing all of the necessary group data um, to, to really like incorporate any group you can think of uh, automatically. And then on the, on the side of tensor operations, um, because of the fact that we got to um, like really change out backends on, in a more dynamic way, uh, we want to start experimenting a little bit with this and see what like the different implementations can do for us performance-wise, but also like the different allocation strategies um, can make like a, a big difference and see, see what, what's going on there. And so, I mean, I guess that, that's it. I, I like, thank you a lot for, for the attention. Um, if there's any questions, um, well, you can find our information on, on GitHub and, and feel free to contact us or ask me now. Thanks very much for the great talk. Um, so are there any questions in the room? Yes, so let's start over here. Uh, there is this package, Tulio, that's uh, good for tensor contraction and uh, automating some of the compilation. What are the pros and cons of tensor operations compared to Tulio? Uh, when should I be using which one? Um, yeah, so, so I have to admit I'm, I'm not as familiar with, with Tulio as uh, I should be. Um, and so, but, but what I can say about this is that, um, so like the tensor operation thing, uh, as far as I know or as, as far as the things that I do know about Tulio, tensor operations is really focused around tensor networks. So we're, we're doing contractions and, and it's basically like the, the very basic um, um, Einstein summation things that are in there. So it will not do any of the max or, or more complicated reducing strategies that you could put in there. Um, but, but one of the things that we actually wanted to do is, is compare or are wanting to do is compare the performance of the two. Um, and so this is basically why we rewrote, we rewrote some of the interface such that we can now start um, experimenting with actually using Tulio as a, a backend for the tensor operations. Thank you. Um, so I noticed that there was a backend that was called native um, as an alternative to BLAS, because I, I guess in, in general, tensor operations is mapping to, to blast calls through tensor permutations. Um, what's the status of this native backend? Is there actually a native Julia tensor contraction? Yeah, so, so um, well, so this is actually w one of the things that, that Yuto has, has developed. So he has this package called Stridit. And so for um, any Stridit array, there is actually an implementation, a native Julia implementation that will uh, do like the, the lazy permutations, or in other words, if you want to do a, a tensor contraction, um, you can get away with contracting these without um, doing the intermediate uh, permutation and allocating this object. Um, and so the status there is that this works, and this, um, this, this is also what we're using if you <laughs> would have like a, a scalar type that's not supported by BLAS. So you could do like big floats or, or whatever uh, other thing you're working on. Um, and it has some support for like even some multi-threaded um, blocking strategies that, that are in there. So, I mean, there is actually like support for this for, for strided uh, arrays. Um, so uh, what, what's the performance like? And then also, is it similar to like TBLIS? Um, so Tbliss also has the limitation of, of being um, actually restricted to, to the BLAS float uh, type numbers. So performance wise, it seems that the, the, like for larger matrices, BLAS is, is very hard to outperform, which is kind of what we expected. Uh, well, for smaller, um, smaller tensor contractions, the, 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 I think the strided uh, approach is still quite, um, quite competitive. Uh, and then again, I, I mean, the, the, the most notable difference is, of course, the support for, for the, the scalar types that are different. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'm very sorry. For in the interest of time, we have to move on to the next speaker, but we will have a coffee break coming up uh, after the next uh, talk, so there will be opportunities to ask your questions then.